tonight we're talking about protein and you have just eaten a complete protein as we used to talk about them because it has grains and a bean product. Now someone asked why tofu? Why not just beans? You could do this with beans and it would work beautifully. You don't have to use tofu. Is there a problem with tofu? No, it's rich in phytoestrogens. Is that good or bad? It's good because phytoestrogens block the estrogens effect on the breast with cancer growth, but they stimulate the estrogen receptor in bone, so it improves osteoporosis, reduces breast cancer risk. So you get both good things, and it will improve hot flashes some. How much? Well, you have to have a lot of phytoestrogens. But there are other phytoestrogens or sources of phytoestrogens in the diet. Flax is very rich in phytoestrogens. Sesame seeds are very rich in phytoestrogens. And all beans are, but particularly black beans and soybeans. They're particularly rich in phytoestrogens. You don't hear much about black beans. The reason is they don't have a, a very high marketing budget like soy does, but black beans are excellent too. So um, just to recap the making of this, there were several people that uh, had a question. The first thing that you do in the pan is you put down a layer of tomato sauce, and then you put down a layer of the corn tortillas. And on top of that, you put down a layer of the tomato sauce plus the, uh, it's the tomato sauce, the peanut butter, the tamari mixed together with the tofu. Then another layer of corn tortillas, another layer, if you have enough corn to tortillas, of the tofu, peanut butter, tamari, tomato sauce mix then another layer of corn tortillas for the third layer, and on top of that, tomato sauce and cheese sauce. Got it? Good. All right. But you know what? If you mix it all up, it still tastes good. Yeah. And some of you got it all mixed up. Sorry about that. But we didn't run out. Isn't that good? Yeah. All right. So protein, first of all, protein has about 22 different amino acids. Most of those your body can make, but there are nine amino acids that you don't make. Those are called essential amino acids. Actually, as adults, and most of us in the room are adults, um, I was talking to my son the other day, and I said, who are you gonna vote for in the next presidential election? He said, the first responsible adult I can encounter. But that's an aside. Uh, as adults, we only need eight. Histidine is necessary in infancy, but it's not necessary for adults. So eight or nine essential amino acids, depending on your stage in life. Uh, and I listed them there. Uh, they're are some characteristics of them that we'll mention again. One is there are three that are called branch chain amino acids, and those are leucine, isoleucine, and valine, and there are several that are rich in sulfur, and that's methionine and cysteine. Uh, cysteine. Uh, so those you can remember or not remember, but it's kind of interesting. Um, so, um, all animal proteins contain all nine amino acids in concentrations that are deemed right for humans. All plant proteins, listen to me, all plant proteins also contain all nine amino acids. You heard me. But, some plant proteins there are very low levels of some of the nine, and so they've de been deemed in time past not adequate. That's really a bunch of garbage, because your body stores amino acids, and you don't need to get all nine every day. If you get all nine some of the time, uh, you can get five one day and four another day. That's fine. So we used to talk a lot, and in the handout it looks like, 
Uh, it's important to get all nine all the time. No, it isn't. As long as you get all nine some of the time. But if you want to get all nine every day, you can. It's really easy. You can eat soy. It contains all nine inadequate amounts. You can eat buckwheat. It contains all nine inadequate amounts for human health. You can eat quinoa. It contains all nine inadequate amounts. Or you can have what you had tonight. Was that okay? It was high protein. And it had all nine inadequate amounts because it not only had soy, but it had corn. And anytime you mix a bean and a grain, you're going to have all nine inadequate amounts. But there are many other plant combinations that are going to give you all nine inadequate amounts too. In other words, don't even think about essential amino acids unless you're on a really kooky diet where you're only eating white rice. If that's all you're eating, you're not going to get all nine inadequate amounts. If you're eating a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, nuts and grains, you're going to do fine. No problems. But um, if you want to make sure you get your protein and all nine amino acids, you can just eat soy or buckwheat or quinoa or any legume and any grain and you will definitely get it. Okay? So that should put to rest the essential amino acids. The, the next question is how much protein is enough? Well, that's been debated through the years. And what you have to remember is that for many years, the majority of nutrition research and uh, investigation was funded by two organizations, the American Meat Board and the American Dairy Association. They might have a vested interest in you eating lots of protein. What uh, you have a list of, of uh, dates and the recommended amount uh, there. The first is a German nutritionist who was very famous. His name was Karl Voigt. And in the 1880s, he uh, decided he would tell the world how much protein that the world needed. And what he did is he went into a German town and surveyed the men and uh, figured out that they were all eating about 120 grams of protein a day and he essentially said what's good for the Germans is good for the world and so everyone needs 120 grams of protein a day and he never asked the question is that too much? That should have been asked. In the 1920s and 30s there was a what? A depression, right? And so somebody started asking can we get by on less? Because there were a lot of hungry people then. And so researchers started looking at how low can we go without any evidence of malnutrition. And so you'll see that uh, Henry Sherman found that no deficiencies if you had 45 grams. And then along came the Natu National Research Council and they said, well, that's so much lower than what we heard about from Carl Voigt that we'll make sure and we'll double that. And uh, then they said, well, maybe that's a little too much. So we'll go for one milligram per kilo. And the average man in uh, the 1940s weighed 70 kilos. What's happened to us? Does the average man weigh 70 kilos now? No, but he did then, and so they said, okay, a gram per kilo per day. And that's, where, that's how much science was in the first recommendation, a doubling of what they found. Well, then Mark Hegstead came along, and he found that if you had all vegetable protein, you could go down to 32 grams and have no evidence of deficiency. And if you had all high-quality protein, that was either animal protein, because it had all nine inadequate amounts, or soy, or one of the others that had all nine inadequate amounts. You could go all the way down to 22 grams of protein a day and find no evidence of deficiency. Now I'm here to tell you that if you try to eat a diet with only 22 grams of protein in it, you will have to eat a lot of refined carbohydrates or a lot of fat in order to maintain adequate calories. It's really hard to put someone on that low a protein diet. 
What I'm saying is that you will get plenty of protein if you don't worry about protein but just eat food. That, that is the absolute truth. Now, another way that we could look at uh, how much protein a person actually needs is to ask ourselves, how much protein does nature provide the fastest growing segment of the population? Now, at what age does a person grow the fastest? Baby, right? As soon as a baby's born, it starts really growing rapidly, and it grows more rapidly if you look at percentage of weight gain than in any other time of the life. So, all right, what does nature provide an infant? Mother's milk, right. Well, what percentage of calories in milk is protein? Mother's milk. 7%. All right, so let's do some math, okay? Uh, if you figure out that the average woman needs 2,000 calories a day, and if you gave her 7% of her calories as protein, that would work out to 35 grams of protein a day for the average woman, if she was still growing at the same rate that a baby was. And most of you aren't, right? So we know just from doing that intellectual experiment that you probably don't need more than 35 grams of protein a day unless you're growing faster than a baby. And if you are, it's probably not healthy growth, right? It's sort of out instead of up. And that's not needed. And for a man, the average caloric intake for a man is 2,500 calories a day. And so that would work out to 43 grams of protein a day. But what's recommended? Well, what's recommended is actually higher than that. It's 0.8 milligrams per kilo per day for men and women. Is that needed? No, it's not needed. It's adequate. You won't become deficient. And what's more, you will get that much if you eat a normal diet. Okay? The point of what I'm saying is this. You will get enough protein unless you're on a kooky diet. If you eat beans and grains and seeds and nuts and vegetables and fruit, you will get enough protein. Getting enough protein is a non-issue. The issue is, are you getting too much? That's the issue. Now, there are a few groups of people that I still worry about protein in. In the last 30 years, I've had two individuals that had this condition, a protein-losing enteropathy. That is a condition where their small bowel does not absorb protein well. And in one case, it was a vegetarian. And in another case, it was a person on a standard American diet. They were still, both of them were protein deficient, though they had adequate protein in their diet. So what did we do? We ramped up the protein. The vegetarian, I had him add protein to his diet. I had him eat a lot of meat analogs. Uh, Loma Linda Food Company used to make a lot of them. Now they're all over the place, beyond meat it's called. But they're high protein and he ate uh, Big Franks. Has anyone heard of Big Franks? Well, he ate Big Franks every day and they're like fake hot dogs. And that brought his protein up. And the other gentleman that didn't want to eat a plant-based diet, he just ate more egg whites because egg whites are high in biological value protein too. The other group of people that can become protein deficient are elderly who are not eating well because they don't prepare their food well and all they're eating is dry cereal or something like that they might become uh, protein deficient. But if you're eating a normal diet, whether you're fully vegan or whether you're on a standard American diet, the biggest problem is not, not enough protein, but how about too much protein? And if you don't remember anything else, remember that. All right, fat and carbohydrate that you eat today and don't need today. Has anyone ever eaten more calories than they need? Okay, 
So if it was fat or carbohydrate and you didn't need it today, your body stores it. The body does not store protein. What you don't need in protein isn't stored. It's changed either fat or carbohydrate and stored that way. But the process of changing protein over to fat or carbohydrate results in the production of urea. Ever heard of urine? Wonder why it's called urine? Because you excrete urea in it. And the process of excreting urea causes you to do some interesting things because urea is excreted as uric acid and acid is acid. And if you, if you pee out uric acid straight without buffering, it will burn. Guaranteed, it will burn. So the body buffers it and it buffers it with calcium. Ever heard of kidney stones? High protein diets can lead to that. Ever heard of osteoporosis? High protein diets can lead to calcium loss to buffer the uric acid and then you can cause osteoporosis. Or the body can buffer it with ammonia. Ammonia is a base and the kidneys can make it but is ammonia good for you? Would you drink it? No. It wouldn't drink it. And, and you can get high levels of ammonia in your urine buffering that urea or uric acid and that causes a whole host of problems too. Or you can eat a lot of protein but it doesn't get absorbed well. Anyone ever notice that if they eat a lot of protein their gas gets a hydrogen sulfide smell, animal protein particularly. Yeah, vegetarians, generally speaking, if their bowels are working well, they pass a little more gas than meat eaters, but it doesn't have an odor. Whereas meat eaters and egg eaters particularly, because of the high sulfur in the eggs, have that hydrogen sulfide. You know what that smells like? Rotten eggs, yeah. And, and so they get that protein undigested down into the colon where it's digested and now it's acid and it's buffered with ammonia. And if it's buffered with ammonia, ammonia is a very strong base. It irritates the colon lining, damages the DNA in the cells there, they start turning over more rapidly, which is why high intakes of protein lead to higher rates of colon cancer. So high protein intake, particularly of animal source that's rich in methionine. Remember I mentioned uh, methionine as one of the ones that is high in sulfur, causes more ammonia production and more colon cancer and animal protein is much higher in that. So you can get too much of that in your diet. Another problem with high protein intake of animal source because of the increased acid load with animal protein is hyperfiltration of the kidneys. Um, I often see patients in my office that have kidney problems. Uh, their creatinine will go up or their ability to filter their blood goes down. The average person filters more than 60 uh, milliliters of blood a minute. And uh, that's great. I want to filter my blood. You know, I don't want impure blood running around. But if you start getting kidney problems, your ability to filter your blood starts to drop off and it'll drop down to 50 or then to 30 and when you get below 20 then we're talking about dialysis and I just had a patient in um, two months ago now she's in her 90s and her uh, filtration rate was down to 20 she was filtering 20 cc's of blood a minute and so I had a talk with her. I said, looking at your kidney function, last time you were in here, 
year, and it had been six months ago, your filtration was a little better. And before that, it was a little better. And if we draw a line through that, you're going to be on dialysis in another six months. Do you want to be? Well, no, at 90, mid 90, she didn't want to be. So I said, well, you don't have to be. You can go on a strict vegan diet. She said, I couldn't do that. I said, fine, go to dialysis. Oh, I don't want to do that. Well, maybe I'll try a plant-based diet. So two months ago, we put her on a strict plant-based diet. You don't think old people can change? No, no, they change easier than young people. I've seen it over and over again. And so she changed her diet in mid-90s, came back this week, and her kidney function was better. The hyperfiltration had gone away, and now instead of dropping her kidney, her ability to filter had in, improved by about, um, let's see, about 30, no, it was about 40%. A 40% improvement in her filtration rate, which is amazing at 95. So it's really important if you have impaired kidney function to think about a plant-based diet unless you really like the social atmosphere in a dialysis unit and if you really like that have a little more animal protein uh, it, it'll get you there all right now there's another thing with protein and i, I mentioned these early and that's the branch chain amino acids they're very rich in animal protein, and they are associated with uh, insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. Uh, we know that if you eat a lot of animal protein, you're at much higher risk for diabetes uh, type 2. You're also at much higher risk for coronary disease, and you're at much higher risk for cancer. But the big epidemic that we're dealing with in the medical field right now is diabetes and metabolic syndrome. And branch chain amino acids play into this very strongly. And uh, so if I see uh, a diabetic that, you know, is heading toward uh, more medication and, and insulin and that sort of thing, if I can get them to reduce their branch chain amino acids, their metabolic syndrome gets better, their insulin resistance gets better, their blood sugars fall, and also their rates of cancer, etc. Uh, so branch chain amino acids are the ones I mentioned, that's the leucine, isoleucine, and valine, and all of those uh, will cause problems with insulin resistance. So if we can get you back onto plant-based proteins, you're going to do a lot better. There's one exception to that and that's peanuts. Uh, and if you have diabetes and you're trying to avoid insulin, you may want to go low on peanuts or peanut butter. Now for the average person that's not got diabetes and it's not an issue, don't, you don't have to avoid peanuts. But peanuts are particularly high in the branch chain amino acids and it looks like they may play into insulin resistance uh, and for those of you that are wanting to uh, treat your diabetes with um, natural methods you might want to choose another nut uh, almonds are a little bit better walnuts are better pecans are better peanuts are in sort of a category by themselves they're wonderful and this recipe had peanuts in it right it was very tasty at least I thought so and I was glad to see there's some left over that no one wanted seconds because I'll have some tomorrow. But um, that's one thing to keep in mind with uh, branch chain. Chicken is much richer and beef is rich and fish is rich and turkey is rich, but peanuts are quite rich in, in the branch chain amino acids as well. There's a, there are a few other things that you should know about protein and that is animal studies have shown that the higher the protein in the diet, the faster the growth is. Maybe that's why cow's milk, instead of having 7% of the calories as protein, like human breast milk, has 31% of the calories as protein. 
So would you want to feed cow's milk to babies? Well, yes, you would if you wanted to grow a great big baby with a little tiny brain. That's what cows are, right? Great big body and a little tiny brain. But humans have a relatively smaller body and a great big brain. And human breast milk is specifically designed to promote that brain growth. And frankly, um, I'd rather be on the larger brain and smaller body. Um, unless I was wanting to be a football player, then it wouldn't matter. Maybe unless you're the quarterback, I guess you need some there. Um, but nonetheless, a lower protein diet is going to make you grow slower and live longer, but a high protein diet will make you grow faster and live shorter. And that's the conclusion of those studies. Um, the, there's another really interesting study where they looked at uh, hormone levels and protein intake. And uh, they put people on a high animal protein diet and then a uh, high vegetable protein diet and alternated back and forth. And what they found is this. They looked at men. They didn't check women in this study, but um, for what it's worth, ladies, you can still listen in. They found that men on high animal protein diets, their cortisol level went up dramatically. It went up about 25 percent, and that's a huge jump. Cortisol is the stress hormone. So as they were eating this high protein, animal protein diet, their stress hormone levels went way up, and their testosterone levels dropped. Any women want to sign up for that man? <laughs> Stressed out and low testosterone levels? And then they put him on the plant-based diet and their cortisol levels dropped and the testosterone levels went up. It makes you wonder why weightlift, li weightlifters go on high animal protein diets because their testosterone drops. And then they often supplement testosterone to make up for that, although they didn't know why they were doing it. Uh, now we know why. And, uh, all right, man, how many want to sign up for a high animal protein diet? No takers. Oh, well. Uh, it makes you want to eat animal protein, right? No. Give me those plants. I'll take some beans. Thank you. Uh, so, what are my recommendations? Get your protein primarily from plants and avoid refined, concentrated plant proteins unless you have protein malabsorption. Why avoid refined, concentrated plant proteins? Here's why. There's another thing I didn't mention, and that's insulin-like growth factor. IGF-1 particularly, there's several insulin-like growth factors. But IGF-1 is a, a chemical the body makes, a protein the body makes, and it stimulates growth. We're not growing very much as adults, and when IGF levels go up in our body, it stimulates cancer growth. Cancer almost always has, has IGF-1 receptors on it. And so anytime your IGF-1 level goes up, your rate of cancer uh, goes up as well. Uh, so. I can tell you that refined plant protein will also push up IGF-1. Like soy protein isolate will push up IGF-1. So I'd rather you get your plant protein with all the fiber, with all the other nutrients and all the other antioxidants. You know, protein is just like carbohydrate and just like fat. If you're gonna burn anything in your body, burn it with the fiber and the naturally occurring antioxidants with it. Because if you burn it with it, you will reduce inflammation in your body. When we burn things in our body, that's called running the body, it causes inflammation. But the food that we should be eating are the foods that have natural anti-inflammatory compounds in them. Beans do, seeds do, 
nut stew. All of those things have the anti-inflammatory compounds, but if you take the protein out and you, you uh, refine it and purify it and concentrate it, you've taken out those naturally occurring compounds and now you're going to have problems with them. So get your protein from plants the way it comes in the plant and you're going to do fine. Any questions? In the back. How do cancer cells affect your protein level? They don't. But protein, high protein intake is very good for cancer growth. The higher your protein intake, particularly animal protein or refined plant protein, the easier it is for cancer to grow. Most people have the idea that cancer grows very easily. It doesn't. It needs lots of sugar and lots of protein to grow. And if you have excess amounts without those antioxidants that are naturally occurring, you have a perfect setup for cancer cells to grow. Second question. My husband had pancreatic cancer and I was supposed to be putting protein powder into his three meals a day. Yes. And that is something that uh, many oncologists do. They recommend high protein intakes. And, and I'll be a little bit... Um, um, that's a dumb idea. Why? Why? Because, because, this is why it's a dumb idea. The body's last defense against cancer is starvation. You see cancer patients losing weight, losing weight, losing weight. We know very clearly that if you give them TPN, total parenteral nutrition, they die sooner. If you force feed a cancer patient, they'll die sooner. There's a balance, however. If they are protein calorie deficient and are starting to have problems with wound healing, you gotta do something. There's always a balance, but generally speaking, it's better to allow a patient to lose weight provided their albumin and protein levels in their blood stay normal, and often that's the case, than to force feed a cancer patient. You'll accelerate their death. Yeah, next question. No, no, I'm not talking about tofu. I'm talking about the, specifically the soy protein isolate. You get it in a powder and it's very refined. It only has protein, no fiber, none of the other things in it. Um, I, don't, I don't recommend protein powders. I recommend that you eat food that's recognizable. Um, soy um, tofu is a step down, it's, it is refined to some extent, some of the fiber's gone, but it's, it's pretty close to a whole food. Would it be better to have beans? Probably. But some people like this kind of flavor, so a little bit of tofu's fine. I wouldn't recommend you throw all beans out and eat only uh, bean curd. That's what this is, is soy bean curd. But you could make bean curd out of any bean. Um, I know that because when I was growing up, my father was a big experimenter and we made our own tofu, but you can make it out of any bean. Question. So those big, huge containers of, uh, like, pea protein, yay, yeah. the market, at Whole Foods and other places. Yeah, the big containers of pea protein and other proteins, I would let somebody else buy them. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't buy them myself. You might give them to a neighbor if they're bothering you or something, but uh, I would not use those unless you have a protein calorie deficiency or a malabsorption problem. And the protein calorie deficiency is really rare and the malabsorption is also rare. But unless your protein is really low, I wouldn't recommend you eat those. I'd recommend you eat food. What about the paleo? I lectured on the paleo diet um, a couple times ago. Look that one up. 
that's a whole nother lecture. Question in the back and then here. In terms of type 1 diabetes, the same is true about kidney function and restricting the type of protein, but high protein intake does not cause type 1. There is a connection, we believe, between bovine serum albumin and the development of type 1 diabetes in countries that have no dairy intake type 1 diabetes rates are much lower than those that have higher intakes of dairy particularly in the children the american academy of pediatrics has come out recommending no dairy intake before one year of age partially because of that association and then a question here yeah is tempeh the same as tofu? It is fine to use. It is a fermented product and uh, there are some other bacteria in there that are actually good for you. I don't have a problem with that, but you can't beat good old soybeans if you want the real thing. There's more fiber, and, but tempeh tastes good. You know, we all use some refined foods. I mean, we had some tamari up here, which is a byproduct of uh, soy as well. Question. The athletes who uh, burn a lot of calories quickly, like cyclists, and take protein powder. Okay, what about athletes and protein powder? They don't need it. I think uh, the person that looked at that the closest who was an athlete uh, was um, the guy that wrote Eat and Run, Scott Jurek. And he said that he found that the best food for an ultra marathon was a bean burrito. I haven't talked my son into eating those yet, but maybe. Uh, ultra marathons I don't recommend um, because your rate of burn is really, really high. And um, I think you're going to do damage to yourself long term. I think marathons occasionally or half marathons, we know that if someone is inactive and they begin training for a marathon, uh, their aorta gets softer, uh, more elastic, not really softer, but they lose the uh, stiffness and they actually get their blood vessels younger by that exercise. So I'm all for exercise, but not 50 miles in a day. Yes, the pea protein isolate. Um, I, I, I do not recommend refined foods, except on occasional basis if they taste really good. That would be soul food, not body food. And you know, there's a place for occasional soul food, right? Just don't eat a lot of it. Question. Any opinions on seaweed? I think it tastes good. I think you can collect your own. Um, but I don't think you need it for protein, although it's a good source. You know, kale has more protein per calorie than beef. So does spinach. So does broccoli. Now, there aren't a lot of calories there, but they have more, more protein per calorie than beef does. So eat your spinach. It's your high-calorie food. Question. There aren't many. Pea protein, soy protein, isolate, basically they're powdered proteins. And unless you're deficient in protein and running a low albumin, I certainly don't recommend them. Question. The powdered collagen supplement be in that? Um, yeah, okay, how about powdered collagen? Where does collagen come from? Meat. Yeah, I won't recommend it. And Question. Why is kale thought of as a cancer-fighting food? Um, because if you grind up kale and drip it or any other green on uh, cancer growing in a petri dish, it slows the growth or stops the growth. And they've done studies of that over and over again in vitro, that means in glass. And so the greens are all shown to do that. And in fact, most plants are. 
uh, sweet potatoes. There's a protein in sweet potato that markedly reduces cancer growth of colon cancer. Um, plants are good for preventing cancer. But having said that, you can eat a perfect plant-based diet and still get cancer, okay? You can have the absolute perfect everything. Genetics play into it, and let me tell you, we do not live in a world that's not polluted. Double negative, I could say we live in a world that is polluted, and pollution causes problems with our genome. It does. Uh, so even if you're on a strict plant-based diet, if you come down with cancer, don't say, oh, that diet didn't work. Say, well, I made it this far. I'm thankful.